Please note, some information portrayed in this video is hypothetical and not proven or endorsed by YouTube themselves. As the official algorithm has never been publicly released, this information is based solely on public evidence, discussion, and limited interviews with YouTube staff. The date is February 1st, 2004, and the Super Bowl 38 halftime show just concluded. There was a controversial moment involving Janet Jackson and Justin Timberlake on stage. I won't go into it here, look it up if you're curious. Tons of people saw this moment unfold on stage, but thousands of others missed it or wanted to watch it again. One such person was YouTube co-founder Joed Kareem. Kareem voiced concern and frustration with his inability to easily find a clip of the controversial moment anywhere on the internet. Google and other search engines were still in their infancy, and video sharing sites barely existed. Even platforms like Vimeo didn't exist at this time. Kareem and their fellow co-founders Stephen Chen and Chad Hurley decided to tackle this frustration themselves. They planned to create a brand new online video platform where anyone could upload video clips of anything they wanted. And in order to make sure people could easily find viral clips, like the Super Bowl halftime show controversy, they added a simplistic algorithm with one major rule. More views equals a higher chance to be on the homepage. This was the birth of YouTube and the first version of the algorithm that dictated which videos succeed and which ones don't. It made perfect sense at first glance. YouTube will serve viewers the most popular videos on the platform. People will want to use this platform in order to see those current viral videos. This was truly the wild west of online content creation. For the most part, people were just dipping their toes into posting videos online. It's important to remember that there were no full-time content creators at this point. YouTube videos didn't make money yet, so the only benefit of getting more views was clout and possibly advertising for something that could make money, like a commercial. There was a problem with this algorithm, however, and it became very apparent very quickly. This version of the algorithm only cared about one single thing views. It didn't care where the views came from, it didn't care how long the viewer stayed on the video, it didn't care if the viewer rated the video, subscribed to the channel, or left a comment. All that mattered was that the number of views increased by one. This was, of course, abused quickly and easily. Since view duration didn't matter, all you had to do was trick somebody into clicking on your video. And thus, clickbait was introduced to YouTube. The authenticity of your video didn't matter at all. As long as the title and thumbnail were intriguing enough to get you to click on it, it didn't matter if it actually followed through on the promise. They already got your view. This was a major issue on YouTube for almost seven years. From its inception in 2005 all the way through 2012. During this time, however, YouTube had been sold by its original founders and purchased by Google. By 2012, Google had noticed multiple flaws with the original algorithm. Not only was clickbait an issue, but YouTube was growing exponentially as a platform. Between 2009 and 2012, YouTube had quadrupled its number of users. The platform had to take care of the rampant clickbait in order to serve its users a more satisfying experience. This led to the first major change in YouTube's algorithm. Starting in 2012, views no longer mattered as much. Videos were now generating advertising revenue for both the creators and the platform. YouTube wanted people watching more videos for longer periods of time. To accomplish this and squash quick... quick bite? Squashing quick bait. To accomplish this and squash clickbait at the same time, the algorithm was updated with a new ideal metric watch time. The longer people watched a video on average, the more it was recommended to new users. You couldn't get away with just clickbait anymore. You had to rope people in and make them stay. Nobody knew exactly what was most important though. Percentage viewed or total watch time. So each creator tackled the change differently. At this point, massive unpolished videos were often more successful compared to something short and heavily edited. If enough people were dedicated to watching 40 minute long vlogs and gaming content, 
those videos performed far better in the algorithm than a three minute long song parody or comedy sketch. If you look at videos posted in that 2012 to 2014 era, short form comedy content was no longer cutting it. It's why some channels such as Good Mythical Morning switched to a longer form, more relaxed content style. This was an incredibly important moment in YouTube's history. It was now the second largest search engine in the world behind Google at this point. People weren't just on YouTube for fun. People were asking questions and looking for answers. The platform was being used in new and innovative ways every day. And so YouTube decided to make the most impactful change to the platform's algorithm that we've ever seen to this day. They didn't want their site to be dominated by low effort, long form content. So in 2015, they made one final public change. They would no longer put so much weight on any single metric. Now, every user would have a personal catered experience that will serve them videos that they want to watch. Not just the most popular videos at the time, but videos hand picked for that individual user. YouTube announced the algorithm we know today, the deep neural networks for YouTube recommendations. I won't bore you with this eight page essay from 2016 on how the new algorithm technically worked, but here's a basic rundown. Every single viewer on YouTube, like yourself, has a secret profile. This profile documents every single thing you do on YouTube. Every video you watch, how long you watch it, what topic that video was on, whether you liked the video, commented on the video, or subscribed to that channel. It keeps track of what videos you click off of, when you click off of them, it keeps track of the videos you don't click on, and so many more tiny little factors you probably don't even realize. All of this information is compiled into your user history and context, represented by this little green box at the top of the diagram. Then, millions upon millions of YouTube videos are all placed at the start of the algorithm. Then, using the basics of your personal profile, it will reduce these millions of videos down to just a few hundred of the most relevant. From there, it will begin ranking these videos down to just the few dozen that you'll see on the recommended page. To do this, it not only uses more specific metrics from your profile, but also other profiles that are similar to yours. So if a dozen other viewers with a similar YouTube profile to yourself enjoyed a video, it's highly likely that you will be recommended that video in hopes of getting you to watch it. Now this algorithm is infinitely more complicated than I just made it seem. I've only given you the absolute basic version without getting into all the algebra and complex architecture. But this is where we currently stand, uh, sort of. Let's go through the last few years. In 2018, this new algorithm had been in place for three years, and YouTube saw a massive shift in how the viewers operated. YouTube's CPO Neil Mohan stated that 70% of all watch time on YouTube was spent on videos that were recommended by the algorithm. This means that that other 30% is YouTube watch time spent on subscribed content, externally linked content, and manually searched content all together. Effectively, over the course of three years, YouTube flipped from being catered by the user to catering for the user. It's somewhat scary to think about, but most of us don't decide what we're watching anymore. It might feel like we do, since we're the one scrolling through the recommended feed and choosing what to watch. But no matter which video you choose, the algorithm put it there to get you to click it in the first place. Now I did say that this is only sort of where we stand with the algorithm in 2024. The core fundamentals of the algorithm have not been publicly announced to have changed whatsoever. As long as things haven't secretly been changed backstage, we are still living in a similar YouTube algorithm as we were in 2018. But there have been changes over the past six years, some public, some not, that might not have directly changed the algorithm, but have had a drastic effect on the YouTube landscape and what exactly the algorithm will recommend. Starting in 2019, YouTube began a heavy focus on the negative side effects of public video creation. 
something they call borderline content. This is content that, while not directly violating any community guidelines, pushes the envelope so much that YouTube still believes it should be taken down or, at least, de-ranked in the algorithm. Many creators found their content reaching far fewer people even though they weren't technically breaking community guidelines, but because the automatic YouTube AI deemed it to be borderline content, the video was hidden and not shown in nearly as many recommended pages as it usually would. One of the most notable examples of this is YouTube's war on profanity in videos, especially in the first 30 seconds. To this day, nobody's quite sure whether it will still affect your ranking in the recommended feed, but YouTube has changed their policy on swearing multiple times over the past five years. YouTube has constantly been taking action to derank specific aspects of videos in order to protect their users from experiencing unwarranted profanity, violence, or otherwise harmful content. However, whatever changes they made behind the scenes were clearly not entirely effective, as fake and often dangerous channels like 5 Minute Crafts still exploit the YouTube algorithm today alongside plenty of other content farms. Much of these protective changes came about from brands and advertisers threatening to pull their ads from YouTube. These companies didn't want to be associated with violent or offensive content, and since they didn't have control whose videos their ads played on, they demanded a change. And you can add COPPA on top of all of this, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. YouTube was sued in 2019 over COPPA, and honestly, that deserves its entire own history video. So if you'd like to see that, do leave a like and a comment and subscribe to the channel. With all of these protective decisions have come some obvious changes that, while never publicly stated, have clearly altered the landscape on YouTube multiple times. You can see that YouTube today is not the same as YouTube in 2019. Channels have come and gone and different styles of content have been the best over the years. From the domination of short form animated content in 2019 by creators like Jaden and Odd Ones Out to the rise of video essays like this one, ranging from 20 minutes to Dear God Quentin! It's obvious that the parameters of what ranks a video has changed over the years and is perpetually in flux. Creators have spent years trying to figure out exactly how the YouTube algorithm will change next. And for the first time in a long time, we actually have a bit of an answer. I can't speak for everyone, but I've noticed a huge change to my recommended page. Can you see it? It's right here a video with less than 200 views. Let's try again. I'll refresh the feed and there's another small video, less than a thousand views. I noticed this myself about three months ago, right around the start of 2024. Videos with very few views are being given a chance on the recommended page and it's almost always a different video. Something has changed in the algorithm to allow small, unnoticed videos to pop up onto at least some recommended feeds alongside all the more popular content. And this is no coincidence. About a month ago, Todd Bopri had an interview with the channel Creator Insider. Todd is the director of growth and discovery at YouTube. They revealed a lot of details regarding the modern state of the YouTube algorithm, namely that the algorithm is not focused on channels or specific creators. Rather, every single video is individually added to the algorithm and ranked on its own merits. With this in mind, I do believe they're adding opportunities for new channels to be discovered. These smaller videos do line up with my current video preferences. All of these smaller videos happen to be Mario or Pokemon focused, which has been my main video format of choice lately. It's likely that even this video or my previous video about the evolution of Pokemon on YouTube popped up in your recommended feed even when it had so few views. This seems like a directly positive change. Obviously, you'll always see more of the popular videos because they get the most clicks, the most watch time, and make YouTube the most money. But it's nice to see YouTube openly investing in new creators by giving them a limited space on people's recommended feeds. They've said that YouTube's discoverability still needs a lot of work. And I do agree. But I'm excited to see how they choose to handle it and possibly give a whole generation of new content creators a chance to be discovered. 
If you'd like to see the algorithm's effects in action, might I suggest watching this video I made about the evolution of Pokemon playthroughs on YouTube. It's definitely worth a watch if you haven't seen it yet. I also want to give a huge shout out to Uteran Samadar's post on vidIQ, as well as Stacy McLaughlin and Paige Cooper's blog on Hootsuite. They helped me immensely in the research for this video and are both linked in the description. Thank you so much for watching. Also, let me know in the comments what you thought about this whole live action thing. I just needed more things to put on screen because talking about the algorithm and visualizing it is very difficult and I'm not a great editor, so I just put my body on screen. Let me know what you think. Thank you.